Welcome to Ben Franklin's World, a podcast about early American history with Liz Covart. The study of history is key to understanding who we are and how we can affect a better future. Ben Franklin's World will introduce you to historical people and events that have impacted and shaped our present day world. And now, here's your host, Liz Covart. Hello, and welcome to episode 91 of Ben Franklin's World, the podcast dedicated to helping you learn more about how the people and events of our early American past have shaped the present day world we live in. Did you know that George Washington's favorite drink was whiskey? Actually, that's a lie, a rumor. According to Mount Vernon, Washington loved Madeira, a fortified Portuguese wine made on the island of Madeira. But if you know a bit about Washington, you know that my suggestion that his favorite drink was whiskey is plausible because Washington operated an expansive distillery at Mount Vernon. So why did I begin today's historical exploration with a bit of false information? Because today, we're going to explore rumors, legends, and hoaxes that circulated throughout early America. Gregory Dowd, a professor of history and American culture at the University of Michigan, will serve as our guide. During our investigation, Greg reveals why men and women created rumors, legends, and hoaxes, and how this false information circulated throughout early America, the role rumors played in shaping Euro-American, Native American relations, and how early American rumor-making practices affect how we create and spread rumors today. But first, I'm recording Interview 100 with historian Joe Edelman in just three weeks, which means I need your questions within the next two weeks. Let us know what you'd like Joe to ask. What would you like to know about me, the podcast, and my work as a historian? Send your questions to liz at benfranklinsworld.com, tweet them to at Liz Covart, or post a comment in Ben Franklin's world, our listener community on Facebook. Are you ready to venture into the sometimes false world that early Americans lived in? Allow me to introduce you to our guest historian. With tidings and wisdom to share about our early American past, here is this week's special guest. Our guest is an assistant professor of history and American culture at the University of Michigan. He is the author of four books, including War Under Heaven, Pontiac, the Indian Nations, and the British Empire, and most recently, Groundless, Rumors, Legends, and Hoaxes on the Early American Frontier. Welcome to Ben Franklin's World, Gregory Dowd. Thanks, Liz. It's really great to be here. I feel like we need to swear Greg in before we start our conversation. You know, like courts do to a witness before they give testimony before a jury? Because we're going to talk about rumors, legends, and hoaxes that circulated in early America. So, Greg, do you promise to tell us the whole truth about the false information we're about to discuss? Uh, I will withhold only some of my evidence, Liz. I guess that sounds fair enough. Now, Greg begins Groundless by stating that, quote, Groundless stories demand our regard, for they, however unreliable, commanded as much attention in early America as did crops, weather, and shipping news, end quote. Greg, would you tell us what you mean by Groundless stories and how they circulated throughout early America? I chose the term groundless and the title groundless for a few reasons. One simple reason was I wanted to tip my hat to some of my colleagues who've written some of our finest books and included the word ground in the title, middle ground, native ground, divided ground, uneven ground. There are a lot of others. I also use the word groundless, though, because of the problem of the evidence in early American history. Indians, after all, left very few of the records that we early American historians examine in order to reconstitute their past. Instead, Europeans, Euro-Americans, French, Spanish, English, left the records for the most part. In other words, even today, early Americanists have to rely on secondhand information on hearsay. Our information may not be exactly groundless, but the grounding of much of American Indian history is often a little shaky. So in Groundless, I face up to this problem of evidence by putting rumors, probably the worst kind of evidence, at the center of analysis. And so to really get to your question, I chose the word groundless because it is one of the defining features of rumor. And I would define rumor loosely as a form of news. It's of an urgent, timely, and important communication. And critically, it's a communication that lacks good grounding in evidence. Rumors are therefore largely groundless. And people generally, when they're reporting rumors, they know that the evidence is uncertain. So in fact, we associate rumors with flight. It's often 
said that a rumor takes off or that it flies through a town. The Ottawa leader Pontiac reportedly called rumors the voice of bad birds. George Washington called rumors flying reports, and that was a pretty common synonym for rumors in the 18th century. So this sense of groundlessness is a key aspect of rumor. And Liz, you ask about circulation. As today, early American rumors circulated through all the media that were available. Rumors were not simply circulated by word of mouth. Colonist rumors and some Indian rumors also found their way into writing, and they circulated widely in letters, in official reports, in missionary journals, and in newspapers. Rumors depended then and now, just as they do today, in other words, on popular plausibility. That is, they had to be plausible to those who circulated them. And this is one of the reasons why I think historians should be very interested in rumors. We get a window into popular views by examining rumors that circulate in a population. And at the same time, rumors depend to some degree on popular states of uncertainty and anxiety. So war, of course, greatly increases these states. But so, I think, did other phenomena like slavery, which created a lot of social tension, epidemics, even the presence of frontiers. And since all of these were part of early America, colonists and Indians had a great deal to wonder about one another, and they rumored a great deal about one another. It's almost like rumors serve as a release valve for fears and tensions that people are holding, especially, as you said, during wartime. Yeah, um, and a release valve is one good way of looking at it. I think even more than that, there are efforts to explore, efforts to figure out what's going on. People are talking to one another about what's happening. They're speculating. And sometimes that speculation kind of evolves into a rumor about what is going on. Even if the rumor is false, it often contains certain kernels of truth. And what's really interesting about them, I think, is that they show people trying to figure out, trying to understand their world. Now, Sometimes rumors or groundless stories evolve into legends. Would you tell us about legends and how rumors become legends? Perhaps you could even tell us about the most famous legend from early America, the Black Legend. The Black Legend is an interesting term because in many ways it's not properly a legend at all. It's rather a kind of a body of legends, a collection of stories that the English speakers told of Spanish colonization, really from the eve of English colonization right down through into the 20th century, these stories circulated. These stories based in some cases on translations of Spanish accounts like Bartolome de las Casas' Destruction of the Indies. These translations emphasized far more than Las Casas would have liked, Spanish cruelties against indigenous Americans. And the general idea was that the Spanish were exceptionally cruel and exceptionally avaricious when it came to their dealings with the peoples of the Americas. And that's the real problem with the Black Legend, is that it served English and later British and then later United States national vanities. It kind of forgave and downplayed the cruelties that attended English-speaking expansion and expanded and elaborated on Spanish cruelties. But that's not all. What really fascinates me about this black legend is that it's not just about violence. It's often also about gold and silver. So when it's discussing the so-called conquistadores and the Indians, it's often talking about riches as well. So there's a dark cloud of exploitation, but then there's this silver lining of wealth. And what I find in my examination of English sources in the 16th and 17th centuries is that shiny, bright side to the black legend, that allure of gold, that allure of riches, had a strong bearing on colonization, and it produced stories about Eastern North America. It produced new stories. It sort of produced new rumors that evolved into legends about Spanish mines in the Appalachian Mountains, Spanish mines in the Louisiana Territory, Spanish mines that were worked by Indians under the Spanish lash. These stories endure into the 19th century. And so we have these American sidebars, if you will, to this larger black legend in which many English and later British colonists and then U.S. citizens came to believe not only that Indians had once gathered gold or silver from the Appalachian Mountains or the Louisiana Territory, but that they had done so as, you know, workers of the Spanish, as slaves of the Spanish. And before the revolution, rumors of precious metal strikes 
in the Smoky Mountains regularly hit the British Board of Trade. I was working in the British National Archives, and I would see these stories of great wealth, great potential wealth in the Smoky Mountains. And then even after the revolution, when in fact gold was actually discovered first in North Carolina and then at a much greater strike in Georgia, in the Cherokee Nation actually in 1829, the part of the Cherokee Nation that was in the state of Georgia, Americans spoke of these places with Spanish names. They referred to them as the New Potosi or a New Mexico. And so the black legend of Spain was tinged with gold and it fed early American rumoring. And for over 250 years, from the 1580s at Roanoke to the 1830s with Cherokee removal from Georgia, there was a quest for gold that was tied up with American expansion. And in both periods, uh, right from the early period straight on through, English speakers sometimes would refer to Spain, and it shows that they had Spain on their minds when they were thinking of these gold strikes and potential gold strikes in the South. Do you think the ideas of gold and silver had more to do with the formation of the Black legend than, say, the supposed cruelty and extreme mistreatment of Native Americans by the Spanish? From the start, the English were very interested in not so much they were critical of Spain, and yet at the same time, they wanted to mimic the Spanish success. So from the very start of colonization, you have this sense that one of the things colonies are about is extraction, the extraction of great wealth. And so these are in some sense rumors of extraction. And as the colonies develop, South Carolina, for instance, is settled and developed. It has even in its charter references to gold and silver and precious metals, and a portion of that will be set aside for the king. You have this hope that that kind of extractive colonization will, if you will, pan out in North America. Of course, it really doesn't, but the hope is always there. And I think it's kind of a perfect colonial metaphor. And it's kind of no accident that those who are very interested in colonization would be thinking in these terms. And I think that's probably why the rumor circulates. It addresses their expectations. Stories of gold and silver were not the only rumors to circulate in early America. Plenty of rumors took flight during periods of warfare, too. Greg, Would you tell us about the Winchester Alarm in Virginia in 1757? In 1757, the young Colonel George Washington, who was commanding Fort Loudoun at Winchester, Virginia, he confronted some uncertain intelligence. He knew it was uncertain, and he reported it to his superiors as uncertain. It's very dutiful. He said that a force of 2,000 French and Indians armed with heavy artillery had left Fort Duquesne at what is now Pittsburgh and were heading eastward to crush Fort Cumberland on Maryland's frontier and then his own Fort Loudoun at Winchester, Virginia. And so he had this information. He had it from a soldier who had come to deliver the message from Fort Cumberland. That fort at Fort Cumberland had gotten the information from a British allied Cherokee scouting party that had scouted around the environs of Fort Duquesne. The soldier himself who brought the news to Cumberland also said that as he was moving from Cumberland to Fort Loudoun at Winchester, he saw Indians in the woods. And Washington was very inclined to believe the story. He had contradictory evidence. There was a French officer who was captured by another Cherokee party and who was detained at Winchester itself with Washington. That French officer denied that it was possible. He said, Fort Duquesne has no such artillery. There's no way that there are 2,000 people moving out of Fort Duquesne. But Washington, understandably, did not trust this man. This man was his enemy. So Washington took action. He made a mistake, what historians acknowledge is a mistake. He recalled men from some outposts to reinforce Winchester, and that put the frontiers at greater risk when, in fact, the force turned out to be a much smaller force, about a tenth of its reported size, and it consisted in the end mainly of small parties of Native Americans who raided the farmsteads that were now less protected because the troops had been brought in to reinforce Winchester. What's most interesting about this episode to me is not that Washington had bad information, that he knew he had bad information, or that he made a bad call that probably cost some lives. He felt he could not wait until he could confirm the story. And, you know, we can't really second guess him. He took a calculated risk and it turned out to be wrong. So this is not about blaming a young officer. What's most interesting to me is that he later tried to figure out what had happened. And in that, we get a kind of an exploration of how people in the 18th century tried to figure out what had caused a rumor, what had caused this bad information. So he knew that bad information was at fault and he wanted to get to the bottom of it. And he decided in the end that it was really the fault of 
Fort Cumberland. He knew that if Fort Cumberland had only had a proper interpreter of Cherokee, it would have gotten more accurate information from that Cherokee party. He decided that the information had gotten muddled, that it had gotten lost in translation because Captain John Dagaworthy at Fort Cumberland did not have a proper interpreter of Cherokee. Not surprisingly, Captain John Dagworthy disagreed with this assessment, and he came up with a different interpretation, which was that the rumor was the result not of a faulty transmission for lack of an interpreter, but rather because the Cherokee scouts themselves were young and that they had panicked and they had misidentified what was really going on. So he thought these young and nervous Cherokee warriors had simply exaggerated what they had seen. So rather than a faulty transmission or a bad translation, as Washington saw it, the rumor was the result of an original misperception that the Cherokees simply, they observed things wrong. Either way, Washington and Dagworthy were both trying to assign blame and trying to locate the exact origin of the rumor, which is a kind of a very 18th century way of looking at things. Who is to blame? Where did it start? In our time, we tend to see other things going on. We tend to see rumors as being generated as a kind of a social phenomenon. We see lots of information feeding rumor. And here we can also see other information feeding this episode. That soldier who brought the message to Winchester thought he saw enemy Indians deliberately showing themselves to him in the woods. Washington himself knew, he knew well from his own experience, for example, at Braddock's defeat, he knew that Indians with French allies could be an extremely formidable enemy, so he had good reason to be concerned. Winchester itself was a remarkable frontier crossroads. All kinds of stories passed through Winchester. Washington himself told stories of Indians performing remarkable feats of war. He greatly admired, in some ways, their warlike capacity, as he would have put it, and he regularly bemoaned his own people's lack of military preparedness. The people of Winchester had experienced earlier alarms in 1755 and 1756. The place was just rife with rumor about French and Indian attacks. And so small wonder when they faced a third alarm in 1757, Washington this time was drawn into it. The story of French Indian power really matched his expectations and experience. And I think that's what makes this interesting. This false story tells us a lot about the reality, which was that the Indians and the French had performed remarkable military feats against the British for several years. 1757 was still, after all, a pretty bad year for British arms. So the rumors help us see, I think, how ordinary Britons, how ordinary Cherokees, how officers like Washington measured their enemies and also how they measured themselves. Rumors seem to have played a very important role in Euro-American and Native American relations. Looking at the Winchester alarm we just heard about, we see that Native Americans fought with the French and with the British and gathered intelligence for both. Greg, would you tell us more precisely about the role rumors played in shaping Euro-American and Native American relations? I think rumor did play an active role in shaping those relations. Partly what it did in many ways was it showed people, let's take Cherokees and Anglo-Americans, Cherokees on the one hand discussing among themselves what those Anglo-Americans are up to, Anglo-Americans discussing what are those Cherokees up to. And as you see each side evaluating the other, sometimes false information really begins to seep in and shape these relations, in this case, in negative ways. The Cherokees and the English colonists, I think, are an excellent example because Cherokees were arguably, and I think this is quite arguable, Britain's best Native American allies from the beginning of the Seven Years' War to 1759. And yet, in 1759, late 1759, the Cherokees and the British colonies went to war, sometimes called the Great Cherokee War. So we see this alliance collapse. So looking at these rumors, we can see in some ways how relations deteriorated. So as we've seen, the Cherokees did support the British by spying on, for example, French Fort Duquesne. Washington himself was a real admirer of their capacity to get within reach of the enemy fort. He knew that no colonist, unaccompanied by Cherokees or perhaps by other skilled Native Americans, could come close to Fort Duquesne, which was surrounded, of course, by Native Americans hostile to the British colonies. So during this time of alliance between the Cherokees and the English colonies in the mid-1750s, 
there were a lot of stories circulating, and of course, many of these stories were true about Indian violence against settlers. It's not surprising that given the great British failures of 1755 through 1757 in the Seven Years' War, that colonists began to look for enemies within. As colonists tried to explain why were there such failures, they singled out Catholics, Quakers, Moravian Christians, sometimes Germans, Irish fur traders, and they also singled out occasionally allied Indians. These people became deeply mistrusted. Those suspicions, of course, did not overlook the Cherokees. The Cherokees had been at sustained peace with the British colonies for decades. Cherokees had helped to preserve the emerging colonial institution of African-American slavery. Cherokees patrolled the frontiers. They really kept slaves from establishing maroon colonies or escaping into the mountains. Yet colonists occasionally held Cherokees responsible for attacks that were mostly committed by other Indians. And even Washington worried at one point that Cherokee Party might have helped the enemy take a Virginian outpost in 1756. The governor of Virginia in that case actually corrected him. So I think it's important to remember that the Indians were powerful and Indians generally were especially free, independent Indian nations that had European allies. They were powerful and that rumors about Indians in the colonies conveyed this colonial fear of Indian power. Colonists admired the Native Americans' stealth, for example. I mean, this was almost a stereotype. But what if that stealth was turned against the colonies? So for the most part, Cherokees saw as well this ambiguity. Cherokees also felt that ambiguity in the alliance. And Cherokees, just as the colonists rumored about their intentions, Cherokees rumored about British colonial intentions. So there was a rumor that circulated in Cherokee country in 1756 that South Carolina was preparing to deliberately infect them with smallpox. It's a remarkable rumor. In 1758, the British were mounting their final push against Fort Duquesne. They were counting on the Cherokees to help gather intelligence to prevent an ambush. But the Cherokees were rumoring at the time that the real reason the British wanted Cherokee men to go to Virginia and Pennsylvania was because the colonists were mounting an expedition to seize Cherokee women and children as slaves. So these are the kinds of rumors that circulate. This is the kind of talk that each side had about the other side. I don't think these rumors caused the Cherokee War, but they gave us an insight into the weakness of the Cherokee-British alliance. They gave us a window into how Cherokees and colonists viewed one another with ambiguity and mistrust. So I think that by paying attention to these rumors, which would only circulate, these rumors wouldn't circulate if people didn't find them plausible. You don't pass on something that you think is a complete lie. We get a sense by paying attention to these rumors, we get a sense of how difficult it was by the time of the Seven Years' War for the British and the British colonists to form sustained relations with Cherokees and actually really with other Indians. This was a period, I think it's fair to say, in which anti-Indian racism fed by wartime violence was becoming the norm among British colonists and allied Indians knew it and they felt it. And I think rumors help us to see that. The Winchester Alarm and Anglo-Cherokee War examples really show us how rumors can be accidentally created. You have a stressful situation, a dangerous situation, and people are really just trying to explain circumstances they don't understand. So they create plausible stories about them. But sometimes people create rumors on purpose, just as Benjamin Franklin did when he served as minister plenipotentiary to France during the American War for Independence. Greg, would you tell us about Franklin's disinformation campaign? What sorts of rumors did Franklin create? And why did he create them? It will not be news to any of your listeners that Benjamin Franklin was a master of information. He understood the press. He understood audience. He understood, I think, a lot about rumors. He knew that a hoax might gain traction if it comported with its intended audience's expectations. And he circulated a remarkable hoax. So while he was in France, as you say, as minister plenipotentiary, he wrote and printed a fake sheet of newsprint. This printed document purported to be a supplement to the Boston Independent Chronicle, a newspaper in Boston. Again, this was a fake. He printed it in France. He printed it using French typeface, but he made sure to find typeface that was very close to what the Boston Independent Chronicle actually used. And he printed this false document. What he meant to do was to embarrass his British enemies, to strengthen the American position at the treaty table. And to do this, he circulated a story in this phony supplement to the Boston Independent Chronicle that had it that a British agent, James Crawford, had sent an invoice just an invoice, like a receipt, to Frederick Haldeman, the governor of British Canada. And this invoice detailed 
eight bales, like an agricultural bale, containing a total of something like a thousand scalps scalps taken from the heads of American citizens on the frontiers. This is a really grisly document. It includes descriptions of how the citizens were killed, how the scalps were decorated, whether the scalps were of men, of women, of the elderly, of children. Even one line has it of infants' scalps, of infants ripped out of their mother's womb. So it's very, very grisly. These bales of scalps, this hoax said, had been given to the British by the Seneca Indians. Now, I have to hasten just to say, if it's not clear at all, this was completely made up. It was completely fictional. Franklin printed this bogus supplement to the Boston Independent Chronicle in April 1782, and he began to put copies of it in letters that he sent to various people in Europe. And when he did so, what's interesting, in his cover letter, he would just sort of offhandedly say, oh, this has fallen into my hands. I'm not sure that the things described are really true. And so he covered his tracks as the author by distancing himself from the fraud. And he would say things like, you know, it's, it, it may not be true, but let's face it, Indians really do scalp people, even women, children. And so he would create the plausibility at the same time, create that sense of plausibility as he's passing on this phony document. Now, deception, lying, it's a part of war, no less than killing is a part of war. And Franklin, he was at war. He meant to add argument before the European and British public that Britain should cede Canada to the United States. Now, he failed in that. The United States did not get Canada, but the United States did succeed in getting a Western boundary that extended all the way to the Mississippi. So the United States did pretty well. I'm not sure that this hoax had anything directly to do with that. But what is interesting is that it spread to the United States. It was reprinted in various newspapers in 1782, 1783. And curiously, it was revived again in print at the time of the War of 1812. So newspapers in the United States on the eve of the War of 1812 and during the War of 1812, this story would appear again. Again, this was meant to demean the British and the Indians. If nothing else, I think this hoax reveals that it was plausible among U.S. citizens to imagine their Indian enemies scalping on this massive scale and their British enemies itemizing and invoicing these kinds of atrocities. The historical record shows us that Native Americans never scalp colonists on the scale that Franklin misreported. But it does report an instance where colonists scalp Native Americans kind of on that scale. A Pennsylvania militia unit under the command of Colonel David Williamson conducted raids that mirrored the atrocity of Franklin's made-up scalpings. Greg, would you tell us about the militia's attacks on Naden Hutton and the Muskingum Valley of Ohio in 1782? Yes, it's a story that needs telling. And it has been told before, I and mean, it's not a new story. I mean, even Theodore Roosevelt's Winning of the West contains some descriptions of it. But probably the most successful Protestant missionaries to Indians in the late colonial period were the United Brethren, more commonly known as the Moravians. These were largely German-speaking pietists who operated largely out of Bethlehem, Pennsylvania at this time. By the time of the American Revolution, they had a few practicing Christian Indian villages in the Muskingum Valley of Ohio. And in these villages, German-speaking ministers and their families worked and worshipped with Delaware Indians, Deacon Indians, and some others. Once the revolution began, and as it intensified, these neutral people came under suspicion. These Moravians, these Germans, and these Moravian Indians came under suspicion by both sides, both the British, the British allied Indians, as well as the United States really were suspicious about these people. Well, in March 1782, American militia from Washington County, Pennsylvania, confronted, arrested, disarmed, and killed over 90 Moravian Christians in their town of Nottenhutten. They killed them in cold blood. The militia murdered the men, the women, and the children. The militia did so after voting on whether they should do this or not. So it was not a rapid decision. It was a fairly cold, premeditated decision. This has to stand among the worst, if not the worst, of atrocities of the American Revolution. These people were neutrals. They were not enemies. But American rumors had it that these people, these Moravian Indians, had been giving comfort and support to enemy Indian war parties attacking the frontiers. So without any trial, and including the children, the Pennsylvania militia killed them and scalped them. This was an outrage. The Americans knew it was an outrage. The Loyalist press seized on it and reported it. The pro-American press tried to alter the facts, suggesting that the killings had been done in the midst of a confusing night raid. That's pretty clearly not the case. 
in any case, no trials of these militiamen were held and the killings went unadjudicated. In Paris, Franklin got news of this and he believed the worst. He believed, I think, that American militia did systematically kill these Christian Indian neutrals, men, women, and children in cold blood. Franklin was in correspondence with a British Moravian Christian, James Hutton, and Franklin's odd response to the killing, and I think this is odd in part because he had responded to the Paxton killings, kind of similar killings in Pennsylvania many decades earlier. He had responded quite differently. His response to this killing was both to condemn the killers of little children and to blame the King of England. So the King of England had inflamed American frontier people to such atrocities. And as proof of the King's responsibility, he enclosed to Hutton this bogus supplement to the Boston Independent Chronicle. That part of the history shows Franklin perhaps at his worst when he sends the bogus Independent Chronicle in order to try to justify the American assault. All of the rumors you investigate in Groundless, and there are many more because you also talk about smallpox and Indian removal. All of the rumors share a common theme. They are Euro-American rumors about Native Americans or Native American rumors about Euro-Americans. And the Euro-American rumors always portray Native Americans as fierce warriors who are a threat to white settlement. Would you tell us why these Euro-American rumors share this theme of Native Americans as fierce warriors and threats to white settlement? I think you're right, Liz, that there's a lot of violence in the rumors that I uncover. And I focus mainly on Anglo-Americans on the one side and Native Americans on the other. English-speaking colonists and U.S. citizens definitely rumored extensively about Indian violence. And rumors, of course, often arise in contexts of ambiguity and fear. So if your sample is rumors, it might emphasize violence. And so maybe it's a kind of an odd cut into the history. I understand the history is not entirely one of violence. There's a lot of coexistence that goes on on these frontiers as well. So that might be a part of it. One of the surprises I had when researching this book was in realizing that English-speaking colonizers especially feared Indian violence when the potential Indian enemy had leagued with a European enemy. So the rumors about Indian violence often also point a finger at a European power. So this is true of, say, Franklin's hoax, right? He's not only rumoring about Indian violence, he's rumoring about British responsibility for it. Similarly with people in South Carolina rumoring about Spain as well as Indians or people in New England rumoring about France and Native Americans. So by contrast, one of the things that struck me too is there was very little rumoring virtually none before the revolution, of independent Indian nations leaguing with enslaved African Americans in a war against the English colonists. I kind of expected to find that. I thought this was the worst nightmare that, say, South Carolinian planters would have, was that the Cherokees would ally with the African American slaves. That rumor really was not present. There was no such rumoring. Some rumoring like that would arise after the American Revolution, but in the colonial period, not so much. So the main colonial fear was of an enemy empire manipulating Indians. So a lot of the rumoring about Indian violence also implicated Europeans. And that I think is fascinating. And I think it does tell us something about the colonial world. We know full well as historians that Indians generally fought for their own purposes, that they weren't simply manipulated by a foreign crown. So why this was so common, I think explains a lot about colonial thinking. We know that the past influences the present. Did your research reveal whether we use any patterns or forms of early American rumor making today? Yeah, I think I can speculate about that maybe in two ways. One is we are simply human beings like early Americanists. And so rumoring is just a part of what humans do. And that's a little different from what you're asking. But, you know, rumoring is a notable part of war. It's part of politics. It's part of diplomacy. It's a part of elections. Ordinary people rumor to demonstrate their contempt for authorities who claim to know the truth. I see a lot of that in early America. And early Americans had particular reasons to rumor. And they left a rich record of rumors because they lived often in these ambiguous circumstances, in these stressful circumstances, especially on the frontiers. They faced epidemics. They faced war. They lived in close proximity often to slavery, which created a lot of social tension. And their authorities did not often earn their trust. American Indian peoples especially had reason to rumor. And so we see a lot of rumors on both sides. So to speculate about inheriting traits of early American rumoring, Americans in the last century, in the 20th century, certainly evinced a tendency that was not unlike, I think, colonial and 
revolutionary Americans to see enemy empires, especially the Soviet Union, behind every anti-colonial movement in the world, somewhat denying those peoples their own aspirations, seeing them as being manipulated by the Soviet Union. Perhaps that's a legacy. I, I don't want to draw that line too much, and I don't draw the line in the book. And I also say that, you know, the black legend has potential current resonance with anti-Mexican sentiment in the United States that might be a part of the black legend. Again, that's somewhat speculative, but there you might draw a more direct line. I'd say rumoring is a large part of what's sometimes called othering or stereotyping in our diverse society. And this happens among all populations. A good example would be during Hurricane Katrina, there were pretty horrible rumors that were circulating at the time about assaults in the Superdome, about black New Orleanians shooting at rescue helicopters. These turned out generally to be false. And then the reverse, there was this rumoring about the deliberate flooding of the Ninth Ward. So you see rumors accompany outbreaks of disease. I think we can expect to see a host of rumors about Zika, if Zika actually proves to be a dangerous virus in the United States. There were certainly rumors about HIV AIDS. So I think these tendencies events our shared humanity with early Americans more than perhaps they're a direct legacy from them. But one legacy is definitely curious, and that's our association of American Indians with violence. And there we see today, it's just fascinating to look at military titles, the Tomahawk cruise missiles, the Apache helicopters, even Operation Geronimo, which was the code name for the Navy SEAL operation against Osama bin Laden. I think we see this association of Native Americans with sort of stealthy violence. Part of the real world of the colonies, part of the rumored world of the colonies, and perhaps a legacy to us today. Let's move into the time warp. This is a fun segment of the show where we ask you a hypothetical history question about what might have happened if something had occurred differently or if someone had acted differently. The time warp. Historians can't predict the future, but they can speculate about what might have been. In your opinion, what might have happened if the Black Legend had not developed in the 16th century? Would the rumors that originated and circulated in early America have been different? Well, the Black Legend's key features, I think, were the strong identification by English speakers of Catholic Spain with exceptional cruelty to Indians and with tremendous colonial riches in precious metals. Without those stories, without the allure of American riches, and without the idea that Indians might ally with Englishmen against Spain, I think the process of early colonization in the 16th and early 17th century would have been different. I'm trying to imagine Roanoke without strong anti-Spanish feeling. Would the colony even have been settled so close to Spanish shipping lanes, privateering, potential for privateering was a part of that colony's mission. I'm trying to imagine Jamestown without the allure of riches. Why was it that it was a majority of men early on? Why was it that a lot of these men had more military than agricultural skills? Perhaps the settlers of Jamestown, instead of being mostly men out to gain quick wealth and domination over Indians, would instead have been more like the later pilgrims or Puritans coming in entire families out to establish communities. Or maybe they wouldn't have come at all. So to wildly speculate, no black legend, no Roanoke, no Jamestown, a much happier Powhatan and a much longer lived Pocahontas. I'm exaggerating, no doubt, but perhaps that's what time warps do. The black legend with its rumors of gold and silver did influence what very early English colonists expected to find in America. And those expectations gave shape, I think, to the colonies that emerged. What surprised me in my research is how long those rumors of Spanish gold in the North American Southeast endured. Now that you've studied rumors, hoaxes, and legends, are you going back to factual historical events? Right. It's a good question. I sometimes tell people that I'm a historian of things that didn't happen. Yeah, I am. In fact, I'm embarking on a couple of new projects. I'm really just at the beginning stages, so don't hold me accountable to these. But one is a comparative study of powerful and explosive indigenous events that take place at the far margins of colonization. So I'm thinking of events like the so-called Iroquois or Beaver Wars, the rise of the Comanches and the Lakotas outside of the United States, New Zealand, so-called Musket Wars in South Africa, the so-called Mefkane that is associated with the rise of the Zulu. I'm thinking about working on a kind of a comparative project to 
see, first of all, how do historians write about it, and then to see if there are any sort of processual kind of conclusions we can draw. And then a second project, which is a little more factual or less historiographic, maybe I should say, is to track some of the loyalists who left the United States and who found themselves or whose children found themselves engaging in indigenous politics outside of the United States. And this is kind of a pattern I've seen. There's some loyalists who left the United States for Canada, Australia, or eventually South Africa, children or grandchildren of loyalists who dealt extensively with indigenous peoples in those places. And so I'm I'm looking at reverberations of the American Revolution on indigenous peoples elsewhere. And where is the best place to find more information about you and how we can contact you if we need more information about rumors, legends and hoaxes, or perhaps if we need to verify some rumors, legends or hoaxes? No doubt the best way to find me is the easiest and most obvious way, which is to go to the University of Michigan's departmental website. My CV, my contact information are up there. They're kept generally up to date. Gregory Dowd, thank you for opening our eyes to some of the rumors, legends, and hoaxes that circulated in early America. I have no doubt that we're going to be a bit more skeptical of the next history book we read. Thanks a lot, Liz, for this great opportunity. It's really been a pleasure. To create and spread rumors is to be human. As Greg explained, men and women create rumors when they encounter stressful and unknown situations. Rumors result because people feel the need to explain the unknown. And this is true even in our own time. When we don't know something, we often speculate about it. But as we learn from Benjamin Franklin's disinformation campaign, rumors need to contain plausible information in order to circulate. People are less likely to spread information that they find unbelievable. And that's why Franklin could get away with printing outrageous scalping figures. People in both North America and Europe knew that Native Americans and Euro-Americans committed atrocities against each other. Therefore, Franklin's outlandish scalping figures seemed plausible to many who read them, and so many passed this false information on to others. The bit I found most intriguing about our conversation is how even today, we Americans associate Native Americans with warlike activities. Until Greg connected it for us, I hadn't given a second thought to how military contractors label their weapons and war vehicles after Native Americans. Although we have so much more Native American history to cover on this show, we've covered enough to know that while Native American warriors were fierce, intelligent, and brave fighters, they were also people with families, cultures, and peaceable traditions. If you'd like to know more about Native Americans, both as warriors and as peaceable people, check out our show notes page. I've posted links to previous episodes that you may find interesting. Plus, the show notes page is also where you'll find more information about Greg and his book, Groundless. Check out benfranklinsworld.com slash 091. Don't forget to send me your questions. What questions would you like to hear Joe Edelman ask when he interviews me in episode 100? Send your questions to liz at benfranklinsworld.com, tweet them to at Liz Covart, or post a comment in Ben Franklin's World, our community on Facebook. And while you're emailing, tweeting, and Facebook posting, let me know what you think. Do you think that we have more rumors in circulation today than early Americans did in the 17th and 18th century? I'd love to know what you think and why. And remember, never leave till tomorrow that which you can do today.